Bronze Bow, Chapter 11 Next morning, a meager funeral procession straggled through the village toward the burial ground outside the gates. There were no flutes, no hired mourners, only a scattering of neighbor women wailing half-heartedly and the trundling cart that carried the body of the old woman. Leading the procession was the lone mourner, a broad-shouldered young man with a fierce, forbidding scowl. After the burial was over, Daniel, turning homeward, saw a hurrying figure coming from the village, and presently, with a burst of gratitude, he recognized his friend, the blacksmith. I am sorry, my friend, Simon said, wringing his hands. I tried to get here in time for the burial. I'll go back to your house with you, if you don't mind. Simon was the only guest at the funeral feast, which the neighbors spread outside the house. They ate in silence, and when the women had cleared away the dishes and left them alone, Simon turned to Daniel. What now, he asked. Is there more to be done? Daniel asked wearily. I mean tomorrow. What are you going to do? Daniel looked away. Since he had received Simon's message, he had managed not to ask himself that question. I had another reason for coming today, Simon went on. I told you in Capernaum that I intended to follow Jesus, but it weighs on my conscience that the smithy is closed. The money does not matter. I've learned to do without that. But it worries me that the tools lie idle while the men have no one to mend their plows. It has been on my mind for some time that you might help me. If you could take over the shop while I'm gone, keep the place from going to seed, I'd be very grateful to you. It was like Simon to make it sound like a favor. Daniel stared down the road, kicked up a spur of dust with his bare feet. He was almost at the point of tears. Yet in the same instant, such a fierce resentment sprang up in him that he dared not look at his friend in the face. They had it all worked out for him. Everyone. The doctor, Leah, the neighbors, and now Simon took it for granted that he had come home to stay. Did he have nothing to say about it? What about his life in the mountains? What about Rosh and Samson and the work that must be done in the cave? Wasn't that more important than a few farmers who wanted their wheels mended? Everything he loved, the wind on the mountaintop, the irresponsible life, the excitement of the raids, rose up and fought off the shackles that Simon held out to him in kindness. The battle did not last long. He was trapped. Simon knew he was trapped. Though he longed to defy them all and fight for his freedom like a mountain wolf, the weakest one of them had defeated him. He could not leave Leah to sit alone in a house with the door barred. Simon, who had waited without speaking a word, was carefully looking off down the narrow street when Daniel finally raised his eyes. Will they bring their business to me? The boy asked miserably. They will depend on you, Simon smiled. If I can find someone to care for Leah while I work, I'd thought of that too, Simon said. My house is connected with the shop. No use having it empty. Why don't you both move in there and use my things? Better to have her where you could keep an eye on her yourself. Not a word about the crumbling mud or the sagging roof or the gapping door which Simon could see plainly where he stood. Daniel's throat suddenly ached. Thank you, he managed. It is good. It's just good business, Simon said crisply. I'm sure of your work. I know my reputation is in good hands. He went on in a practical tone, explaining some of the problems of the trade, the work that this man or that man was likely to demand. One more thing, he added. From time to time, not often, one of the legionaries comes into the shop for something, a broken harness or clasp. They have their own forge at the garrison, of course, but sometimes a man needs a repair done quickly. Daniel bristled. 
I will never serve a pig of a Roman. Yes, Simon said levelly. You will serve him, and civilly too. There is something you will have to learn, my friend. An outlaw may think he is accountable to no one, but in a village every man holds his neighbor's safety in his hands. If a legionary is in a mood for trouble, any excuse will do. A single insult could cost half the lives in the town in the end. That is the one thing I must ask of you. To Daniel it seemed the final blow that struck his shackles in place. Simon laughed. <laughs> it's not so bad as all that. After all, a horse deserves a comfortable bridle, whether it belongs to a Roman or no. Besides, a good zealot does not bring down suspicion on his roof. Daniel looked at his friend sharply. Did Simon mean, did you think you had to give up serving your country? All the patriots don't live in the mountain. There are zealots in blacksmith shops too. Do what you will. The place is yours now, so long as no harm comes to my neighbors. Can I count on you for that? You can count on that, the boy said, feeling a measure of hope and a great gratitude toward his friend. I'm going back to Capernaum tonight, Simon said. Perhaps you can find a neighbor to help you move your things. Before dark, Daniel climbed the mountain and explained to Rosh that he must stay in the village. Rosh heard him out in silence. Then he spoke. This witless sister is more important than your country's freedom? Daniel flushed. No, but I cannot leave her alone. They boast of charity in the synagogue, don't they? Let them care for her. Daniel remembered the untouched loaves of bread tossed through the window. She would starve, he said. I've said it before, Rosh said with scorn. You're soft. This time, Daniel did not look away. He faced his chief levelly. I will prove you wrong, he said quietly. I will work for the cause in the village. You will see. I belong here, on the mountain. I'll never forget that. But now I'm going back, and tomorrow I will move into the house of Simon the Zealot. Next morning, he cleared out the little house. There was practically nothing worth taking. Surely there had been more than this on the days when he had lived with his grandmother. He remembered very clearly a blue glazed dish that she had cherished and a red woolen rug that had hung against the wall. Probably she had sold them for food. The decent and usable things he could salvage from the whole house went into a very small pack. Since his grandmother had died, Leah, sat quietly, waiting, her hands folded. Like a small child, she did as she was told, ate what he brought to her. Will grandmother be hungry? she asked once. No, Daniel answered. Is it cold where she is? She will never be hungry or cold again, he promised her. Now he explained to her as gently as he could that they must move. Simon's house is much nicer than this. It will keep out the rats and the rain and the cold in winter. You will have a mattress to sleep on, like a rich girl. She listened with wide, unfathomable blue eyes, and he thought she understood. But when the moment came to leave, he saw he was mistaken. As he opened the door, she shrank from the sunlight as though it was a sword. Outside, in the roadway, a handful of neighbors had gathered to watch their departure. One glimpse of them sent Leah cowering against the wall. Nothing Daniel could say persuaded her to move a step. Daniel's impatience mounted. He was tempted to pick her up and carry her without any nonsense. But some instinct told him that if he laid a finger on her by force, he might never win her back again. Finally, he went out to speak to the neighbors. It is no good, he told them. She can't abide being looked at. We could never get across the town. I will have to leave her here alone while I'm working. Better tie her up, one man advised, keeping the width of the road between him and the house. Kin of mine has a daughter as possessed. 
They've kept her on a chain all her life. Daniel shook his head. He'd seen such people, poor raving creatures tied to trees like dogs. Before he put a rope on Leah, he would stay in this house till it crumbled to pieces around him. He went back into the house and slammed the door behind him, sending a shower of dust and clay across the floor. In the afternoon, he answered a cautious knock. Just outside the door stood a vehicle, so extraordinary that he stood peering at it, not realizing what it could be. An aged carpenter who lived a short way down the road stood beside the thing, grinning. It's a litter, he explained, like those fancy Roman ladies ride in. Lift your sister in, and she'll be as snug as in her own bed. My wife sewed all our cloaks together to make the curtains. There's four men ready to carry it for you, and we'll stay out of sight till she's inside. A lump pushed up against Daniel's throat. Once again, he felt shamed. Why should they show such kindness to a stranger and an outcast? When every neighbor had tactfully vanished from the street, Daniel inveigled Leah into taking one look through the door. That's the way queens travel, he told her, the way the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon. You will sit inside it and will pull the curtain tight around you. In no time at all, we'll be at the new house. She shook her head. He did not hurry her. He could see that her curiosity was piqued. From time to time, the blue eyes slanted toward the door. No one can see me in there, she said finally. Not so much as your little finger. Do I have to go away from here, Daniel? I want you to be near me when I work. Wouldn't you like that, Leah? After a long time, she seemed to give in. She moved toward the door and stood, still terrified. Then, before she could refuse again, Daniel picked her up. She hid her face against his shoulder, whimpering, but she did not scream. He lifted her gently into the little box and drew the curtains around her shuddering figure. So Leah traveled across the village like a queen. Behind her strode Daniel, carrying the sack that held all their belongings and leading the small goat by its tether. A neighbor boy carried the loom, the only valuable thing that Leah possessed. There was so much work to do in the new house that he scarcely had time to think of the cave. Very early in the morning, before the women and girls were likely to be about, he carried the water jars to the well. This was not a man's job, nor was the sweeping or the cooking or the washing of clothes. Still, these things had to be done after a fashion. He had learned to take care of himself in the cave, where there had been no women to wait on them. But everything was more complicated here in the village, and in addition, there was Leah to provide for. The moment the shop door was open, villagers appeared with work they had saved for Simon's return. They watched the strange young blacksmith with suspicion, waiting to see what he could do. Daniel took up the challenge. He could not deny that it was a satisfaction to step every morning into Simon's tidy shop, stocked with bars of iron and hung with rows of tongs and chisels and hammers. For five years, Daniel had smelted his own ore and fashioned it with clumsy makeshift tools. He had never realized that he was learning to make up in skill what he lacked in equipment. After a little practice, he discovered that he could make Simon's tools do just what he wanted them to do. The work he turned out was true and light and strong. Word went around that the new smith was a good worker for all his fierce, unapproachable scowl. With money in his pocket for the first time in his life, he was able to buy meat from the butcher and round flat loaves of barley bread from the baker. He did not eat as well as he had on the mountains, where meat from the farmer's flocks had been free for the plundering, but he suspected that Leah had never known such plenty.
Once the shock of the journey and the terror of the new house wore away, Leah settled down unprotestedly. She began to take pleasure in very small things, in combing her long, fair hair, in arranging the row of jars along the shelf, in watching the pattern of sunbeams along the plaster wall. She reminded him of Samson, the way she did not want to let him out of her sight. Odd, he thought, how he had shaken that great black shadow only to be chained now to a little gray one, scarcely bigger than a mouse, but inescapable. Leah insisted that the door between the house and the shop be left open. For hours on end, she sat and watched him through the opening. When customers entered the shop, she would disappear, waiting concealed in a corner till they had gone. Sometimes he suspected that she watched him, too, from behind the long yellow hair. Daniel was concerned that she was idle all day long. He urged her to work at the loom, but though she was willing, she had no notion where to procure the thread. Her grandmother had brought her thread and taken away the finished cloth. That was all she knew. One morning, however, a man called on the shop, not with a tool to be mended, but with a skein of fine linen. He was the servant of a wealthy widow in Corazon, who, it appeared, had bought all the cloth that Leah had woven. Daniel had assumed that charitable people had bought Leah's work out of pity. He was astonished to learn that this woman knew or cared nothing about his sister and desired the cloth for its fine quality. The servant was much relieved to attract down the weaver. Daniel set up the loom in the corner so that, sitting before it, Leah could see through the open door into his shop. Then he watched with amazement as she threaded it with expert fingers. One morning, when business was slack, Daniel discovered a measure of wheat flour on Simon's shelf and decided to try his hand at bread making. He lighted a fire in the clay oven outside the door, measured out a little pile of the flour, stirred in some water, and began to pat the lumpy mixture into a flat cake, trying to remember how his mother had once done it. Absorbed in the work, he was startled when two small hands suddenly thrust themselves into the mixture. That's not the way, Leah said softly. She patted the lump on a flat stone, rolled it deftly with a flat roller which she took from the shelf, and handed him the thin circle of dough ready to plaster against the wall of the oven. It gave off a delicious fragrance as it baked and came from the oven crusty and satisfying. After that, they made their own bread together and saved the money that had gone to the baker. She taught him how to save a bit of dough for leavening for the next day's baking. An even greater surprise was to come. Behind the house, Simon had planted a small plot of vegetables, enough to supply his own solitary table. Through the luxuriant tangle of weeds which had sprouted untended, Daniel had glimpsed the shiny green of a cucumber, and one evening after he'd closed the shop, he went out to clear away the weeds and see what else might be hiding there. He had worked for some time, liking the feeling of the green plants and the smell of the earth, when he heard a soft footstep behind him. And suddenly, Leah knelt beside him, thrusting her hands into the green leaves, and she had thrust them into the dough. Don't, Daniel, she said. You're pulling up all the carrots. He watched her, almost afraid to speak. See, she showed him, these red leaves are beets, and these are onions. All the rest are weeds. After that, Leah spent many of the daylight hours in the garden, hidden by the high surrounding wall. Her pale cheeks took on the faint golden tinge. Blowing up his fire in the shop, Daniel pondered, without the faintest idea of what had really gone on in that dim shuttered house behind the cheesemakers. He had taken for granted that Leah had lost her wits on the terrible night of her childhood. Was he any better, he thought now, with shame, than the neighbors who would have tied her with ropes? Nor could he blame his grandmother. She had been grief-stricken and worked to the bone, terrified by the child's screaming spells, afraid to trust her with any household tasks. 
Now he saw that Leah remembered actually almost everything she had watched her grandmother do. Praise be, she could take over most of the work of the house from now on. And he would feel more like a man. Yet as the days went by, he saw that he had been too quickly encouraged. The weaving progressed at snail's pace. The slightest effort exhausted the girl. She was often fretful, complaining of the horrid men who came into the shop and demanding that he lock the door against them. He could not get it through her head that he had business to carry on. At a moment when he seemed most contented, a knock at the door, a shout in the distance, the most trivial sound could reduce her to utter helplessness and it might be hours or even days before she would so much as pick up a spoon. On other days, she swept out the house, combed her hair, and sat passing the shuttle through the threads for hours. Daniel gave up trying to understand her and accepted her, as he had accepted Samson, as a burden he was doomed to carry. Late one afternoon, Daniel looked up to see a legionary standing in the doorway. He had almost forgotten Simon's warning. But even as his hammer arm stiffened, he remembered and laid down the hammer on the stone. He did not spit, but there were other ways of showing his contempt. He bent over his work, absorbed in it, sanding over and over an imaginary flaw on the surface of the smooth metal. Finally, in his own good time, he raised his head. He saw that he had made his point. The soldier's face had flushed in angry red, but he said nothing. Doubtless, he too was under orders to preserve the peace. My horse has a broken bridle ring, the soldier said, in stilted, reasonably good Aramaic. Daniel reached for the thing as though it were a scorpion. It'll take time, he muttered. Come for it tomorrow. I need it at once, the Roman answered. I will wait for it now. Daniel studied him trying to assess how much delay the man would tolerate. Then, with a shrug, he set to work. The sooner the job was done, the sooner his shop would be rid of the man. The soldier did not sit down on the bench by the door as ordinary customers did. He hesitated through pride. Daniel would not admit that it might be decency waiting to be asked. Let him rot away on his feet, Daniel thought. He would get no such invitation in this shop. Turning his back, Daniel seized the bellows and blew up the fire. When he straightened again, the Roman was pulling off his helmet, revealing crisp, fair hair. He wiped the back of his hand across his wet forehead where the metal had left an uncomfortable-looking crease. With a shock, Daniel saw that he was very young, certainly no older than Joel. The beardless cheeks and chin scarcely needed a razor. His skin was white, mottled and peeling from exposure to the sun, so that he could not have seen service long under the Galilean skies. The eyes that stared back at Daniel were a clear bright blue. He looked as though he might be about to speak, and Daniel turned his back and resumed his work. He took a ridiculously long time for the simple job. When finally he turned again, the soldier still stood, looking hot and uncomfortable, swinging the bronze helmet from one hand. He was no longer looking at the anvil and Daniel, swinging to follow that intense blue gaze suddenly stiffened with horror. The door to Simon's house stood open. Leah, who had surely not known the man was there, was coming through the little rear door from the garden, her hands full of green lettuce. The long golden hair streamed from her shoulders, lighted up all around her head from the sunlight behind her. Her eyes, blue as the Ketza blossoms, were empty with surprise. Before she could shrink back with one lunge, Daniel slammed the door between them. Murderous hate boiled up in him. How dare the man look at his sister? The very touch of his eyes had defiled her as surely as though he had touched her with his hand. Daniel was quivering as he handed over the bridle ring. It took every ounce of his will not to hurl the coin back into the blonde face. That night, he began again to think of the mountain.